Have you ever heard the tale of King Eumenes of Pergamon? Well, allow me to fill you in with this very accomplished man. This is going to be a story of succession, wars, strategies, and gods. And who better to tell this story than the man himself from before he was actually king? You could already say my life is more successful than most. I'm only 18 years old, but I'm already in command of the Pokemonian Royal Guard. You might ask yourself, how did I get this rank? And to be honest, it is more about luck and heritage than anything else. King Philetyros, my distant uncle, had no children of his own. And with my father dead, who I never knew, as well as no other male to succeed him, he began grooming me as his heir. That is at least what my theory is all about. So far I haven't done anything actually. But now I have the perfect advantage to prove my skills to the world. And I had just the plan. The Bithynians to the north had been at war with the Seleucids for as long as I can remember. My uncle always told me the Seleucids were bad people, someone to fear. But I never did. Their guards had frequently visited the royal palace asking for the true heir of the empire. And my uncle, the king of course, always looked in distress whenever this happened. And yes, it happened more than once. You know what? I don't know why I'm telling you this. As everyone knows, they are talking about Alexander the Great and the rumors about him secretly having a son who never was found. But this was of course a long time ago, from when my father was born to be exact. But he is of course dead, so he can't tell me anything about it. This is why I wanna go to my comedia. I believe they have the answers to everything. After all, why would the so mighty Seleucids be at war with this minor faction, if not they do something about the whereabouts of Alexander's true heir? If I find the right answers, all of the Hellenic world could be united once again. But fearing the Bithynians might believe I am a Seleucid traveler, I brought the royal army as protection. And of course, they did believe so. They couldn't see past our different banners, but believed due to our similar armor, we were one and the same. Of course, their resistance was futile as we captured the town, sparing as many as possible, like my uncle would have done if he was in command. I questioned the now captured king of Bithynia and explained everything. How we were from Pergamon and seeking the answers about the heir of Alexander. He sadly refused to comply with any of my questions, so I left him in the hands of my Polymark, which was a bit more effective, let's just say that. But the answer he gave me, I'm not sure how to feel about this. Sinope. Sinope of all places was where we needed to go. Of all towns in the known world, it had to be where I was born. With all haste, I returned home by ship. I wanted to tell my uncle about the findings and also make sure my people were safe. After all, the Rhodians have been rivals of Pergamon for a long time, with a war undoubtedly on its way. He said something about, don't worry about us humanists, blah blah blah, I should return home at last, blah blah blah, and there was something I needed to know before I left. And guess what? The bell started to ring, signaling a Rhodian army was on its way. This meant my uncle had to rush out while I needed to leave the city before it was under siege. So I didn't get to hear anything. How typical. And I don't feel good about leaving the city behind. Most of our fighters will leave alongside me after all, meaning Pokemon will practically be empty. Still. 
My curiosity got the better of me. I and my men traveled northeast to Sinop. But once again, we found nothing but hostiles. Positioned outside of the town with both armies ready for a fight, I shouted to the leader of the garrison. There doesn't need to be a fight. I'm just seeking answers. He responded though. We know who you are, Eumenes, son of Philip. There is no place for you here. In my confusion, I knew only one thing could happen next. It is time for battle. So, as far as I remember from my tutoring, the most effective tactic is the oblique order. So that is the one, of course, I am gonna form up in today. But a head-on assault on the town would be suicide, so I led the cavalry forward to draw the enemy out. Unable to deal with the Pokemonian Royal Guard, the remaining garrison surrendered. It is now time for me to enter and visit my former home. My first proper battle and the losses were minimal. I mean, this was not exactly my first battle, but the siege of Nicomedia was more like a forced surrender, so I won't count it as a battle. But this one here was actually with a garrison trying to hold us off. And we did it superbly. This was exactly the confidence boost I needed. And oh boy, I'm about to need it now. Because in all the wrong ways, everything seemed to click. As I stood in the town square, four messengers arrived at the same time. Something bad must have happened. After all, why would they come to me and not my uncle? The first messenger told me about a map showing the location of the remaining Sinopian armies. They had traveled inland into Galatia where they were trying to take Ankara. This one of course I do understand, obviously this was my war so it made sense for them to give me all the intel. But the same could not be said for the rest. The king of Arch Bosporus wished for an audience with the king of Pergamon asking for a defensive alliance to keep the Black Sea safe and secure and also that I would need someone to rely on for the struggles ahead. And then even weirder than that, the third was a message from Pontus with the king Mithridates challenging me for combat and the claim to the Macedonian Empire. My understanding of their words must have vanished, me in need of allies and claim to the Macedonian throne. In disbelief, I asked, what is it you are not telling me? It seems like all of you know something that I don't. They all looked confused at each other and then back at me. The fourth messenger stepped forward saying, I carry the answers you seek. In my hand, I hold the will of the now former king, Militairos, 
which states that Eumenes, son of Philip, son of Alexander the Great, shall receive all titles and ranks to the kingdom of Pergamon. He kept talking but I didn't listen anymore. Then everything got dead quiet. A massive flash appeared before me and I fell to the ground. As I woke up in my tent, confusion struck me. Where am I? We must be on the move, but I simply don't know. I decided to walk out of my private quarters in search of answers. Luckily, the answers found me first. One of my polymarchs rushed over to me. You are awake, my king, he said, almost as if he was surprised and honored by my presence. Yeah, I, I feel different, calm, lighter, as if I could take on the world. That is good to hear, my king. As you were unconscious, the second in command, Eurytus, took charge and ordered us to move out against the challenger Mithridates of Pontus. Okay, good. I'd have done the same. We kept talking for a bit, you know, tactics, logistics, stuff like that. But I still wondered what happened earlier. The bright flash almost felt godlike. It must be a sign from Zeus himself. Yet I have no clue on what they want. Olympus must be on my side in this conflict. I hope. The rest of my travels were boring. But luckily, excitement was just around the corner. We have arrived at our destination, ready to face the challenger, Mithridates. Greetings, Eumenes, grandson of Alexander. Have you come to surrender your claim? He said, which made his men laugh, almost as if a giant was present. I gave him no reply, but a raised sword. The battle would begin. I had honestly forgotten already I was the grandson of Alexander, till that scum mentioned it. My faulty memory made me too embarrassed to think of anything witty to say, but thankfully actions speak louder than words. I ordered the royal guard to move against the reinforcing army in an oblique order to see if we could deal with the enemy before they linked up. It didn't work and now all of the enemy forces were moving against us. We are severely outnumbered here, but maybe we have a chance. After all, my grandfather Alexander did it multiple times. Unable to cope with the high pressure, my hoplites broke and scattered, meaning I was forced to surrender. This could only be bad. I couldn't look my men in the eyes. Humiliated by the likes of Mithridates, I didn't deserve my lineage. An agreement was made with the foul king getting the claim. For now, he is the heir of Alexander. But in my misery, a tall man with bright lights surrounding him, making it impossible to recognize his features, spawned just before me. Who, who are you? I asked. I am the ruler of the sky and Olympus. But at the moment, you're blazing of knowledge. What knowledge? Can you help me? Tell me more, please, oh mighty Zeus. You, my little menace. Grandson of Alexander, are destined for greatness. But the journey ahead of you is long and devious. 
Many people will resent you and even more attempt to end it. I cannot give you the answer you seek. Yet, pointing you in the right direction is something I can. You should not rely on the oblique order alone to fight your battles. Hence, I give you this map. All across the broken empire, in some of the largest settlements, writing of great tactics can be found. Seek their wisdom and use it. Another path you must follow is the steps of Odysseus. Gain control of the Acheron in Epirus and gain the power of a second life in case of disaster. Seek the Oracle of Delphi. Her knowledge could become crucial for your journey ahead. There are more secrets before you, but those you need to discover for yourself. As sudden he arrived, the quicker he vanished. All these tasks are ahead of me, but he never mentioned in what order I should follow his advice. I wanted to ask for assistance from my advisors, but time wasn't on our side. The Sinopian army had returned from Galatia, seeking to recapture what I took from them. Yet I will defend it to the end. After all, it was the home of my father. It appears as if the blessing of Zeus was still upon me, as my men and I heroically defeated the enemy force. If we capture their last settlement in Galatia, we might be strong enough to retake our claim. Maybe even follow the advice of Zeus. But before we could react, reinforcements arrived to stop us in our tracks. Luckily, this time we had a river to assist us. We spotted a minor force trying to cross the creek, so I ordered my men to form up on the other side to create a bottleneck. They would all attempt to break our blockade, but with water to their knees and the spears and rocks we threw at them, they didn't stand a chance. With no great struggle, they withdrew back into Galatia. But feeling this was way too easy, I ordered my scouts to run further down the river. The Sinopians had built a bridge which they used to outflank my forces. Our men of course weren't ready for fight here, and fearing we could be outflanked on the open terrain, we crossed the creek ourselves, only sacrificing a few noble soldiers. They were true heroes of Pergamon. But now on the other side of the current, we could use the same tactic as the one we used against the former army. I also sent my cavalry down to their bridge, which they forgot to destroy, so we could outflank them. With the enemy on the other side, we could easily harass their forces, stuck in the water, giving them little to no chance of survival. They eventually routed, allowing us to live another day. Victorious, but with many casualties once again. We pushed on into Anatolia. But I couldn't stop wondering what the tactics Zeus mentioned could do to aid us. Surely something remarkable, with wit to rival Odysseus himself. But never mind, because before we marched on into the city, I ordered my second in command, Eurytus, to muster new forces. He wouldn't arrive till after the siege of Ankara, and at this point, his forces didn't matter. Because in this settlement, proper barracks were already built. This is certainly a chance to improve our armies. Still, I don't know if we have time for it. My late uncle always said, a good king always knows what to do, but a great king always listens to his advisors. Hence, I summoned all of them into my tent and showed them the map I got from Zeus and all the different paths before us. Take revenge on Mithridates and reclaim our title, as every second without it brings shame to both my ancestors and me. Travel home to Greece to gain control of the Oracle of Delphi and the Archeron River, which both could be useful for future endeavors. Maybe search for another tactic to help us for future battles. 
all return to the city of Pergamon. So far, our great capital has survived at least one siege from the Rhodians, but another is already on the way. We could sneak past them and capture the island, or just defeat them decisively on the field. This is obviously a highly significant decision we need to make that will determine the future of Pokemon and the Hellenic world. So I won't bother you with all the details of our long and exhausting discussion. But a plan was made and I think it could be alright for us. Advisor Sumari gave a grand plan of how he believed we should proceed. The Seleucids who have harassed my uncle and his reign for decades are now on the brink of destruction. He therefore advised us to ally ourselves with the mighty Ptolemies to take out the Seleucid satrap Lydia. With their regions under our control, revenge on the warlike Rhodians could be possible. And after that we would undoubtedly become a massive economic superpower in Asia Minor. He also mentioned how we then could travel back to Greece and take out the Macedonian pretenders. They will suffer for their lies and deceptions. But Sohan had an expansive network of contacts all over the Greek world. He mentioned how the Epirate king Pyrrhus had fallen by demons of the west. Rumors say they were summoned into this world by Hades to destroy everything touched by Alexander. It is most likely just a scheme made by our enemies to scare us into hiding. But that won't happen. Overall, the agreement was on us securing Anatolia so we could use it as a power base for our future expansion. Advisor Cato also made an excellent proposal. He had analyzed our former battles. From this, he realized even though our tactical knowledge might be inferior, usage of the terrain could always help secure victory. He therefore pleaded we should seek engagements wherever we are favored. This could be anything from ambushes and fortifications to river crossings and narrow terrain. With the plan set and a method agreed upon, I ordered my men to break camp. The march south began. Before an all-out war with the Seleucids actually could begin, we had a lot of things we needed to do. The former king, my uncle, had already made plenty of treaties in the past just to keep them away. He was always too scared of what seemed larger than himself, but I weren't. We broke his agreements, which Antigonus didn't appreciate. He most likely expected us to help him in his war against Ptolemy II. But for now, we would ally with the Egyptians instead. Potentially, this could just be another stupid move to replace one Daidoshi superpower with another. But while they bring chaos to each other, we will rise like a phoenix. We began taking our new barracks from Ankara into good use. Ever since our loss to Mithridates of Pontus, we had to replace my reliable royal guards with local warriors. Inferiors, you might say. Don't get me wrong, they've been useful in combat and have achieved great glory while bringing much needed success to a Pokemon. But if we were to take on the loyal Lydians, I, King Eumenes, needed to mimic my grandfather Alexander. We started to train Pergamene soldiers in the way of the pike. They could strengthen our center which we lacked at our battle against Pontus leading to misery. With our biggest weakness patched, I traveled to Side, where I would meet Ptolemy II. After a long day with wine and other festivities to amuse us, we formed a non-aggression pact alongside trade and military access. Your words are wise and strike to the heart of our dealings. Pharaoh, strength and health to him will be pleased. He might have been a bit drunker than me, as he gave me plenty of gold in exchange for our dealings. That or he is just trying to bribe my friendship so I don't take him out when I inevitably regain my claim to the Empire. As long as he doesn't know of our plans, everything is good. A month or so went by with further preparations being made. But now the time for war has come. I marched into Iconium with favor from the people and the gods. 
it is time to see our new troops in action. This would be the first trial of my army. I need to make sure I could rely on them before a proper battle took place. I positioned my men in a straight line. The terrain was very uneven, making our oblique order obsolete. But after scouting ahead, I realized the enemy were moving past a massive hill. They ordered all my auxiliaries to occupy it, while the newly recruited royal guard would position themselves at the bottom of the ridge to block their path. Once everyone was in position, our men on the hill revealed themselves, piercing the enemy. My men have proven their reliability to me. Of course, the odds were far in their favor, but now I know they are capable of dealing with main armies without much trouble. Hence, I decided to expand our army even further with more pikemen and well-trained Pokemon cavalry. Not with the same quality of Alexander's companion cavalry, of course, but powerful enough for now. In the midst of our recruitment, an ally of Pontus, the Cappadocians, declared war on us. They were probably working with old intel based on us recently losing to Mithridates. This could be our strength. Our new holdings and skilled fighters are definitely ready to be battle-hardened in a proper fight. I ordered my agent to scout out the enemy to see what they had in store for us. Two grand armies almost rivaling the infamous King of Kings himself. I thought to myself, how could I defeat him? Then I remembered the advice from K2. We needed to use the terrain, else we would be outflanked and lose once again. With no river ahead of us, we had to make an advantage of our own. An encampment with high walls, towers and open terrain all around us to spot the enemy would suffice. This was a risky move, using myself as bait could very well cost my life. But rather that than them assaulting Ankara. Blessed by the gods, the Cappadocian took the bait. Surrounded in our fortification, I could only hope this would work. This would be a genuine trial for my men. The first army was moving towards us from our left. Luckily by now, we had managed to recruit three sets of Pergamene pikemen. With one at each of our entrances, we should be safe. As soon as the enemy second army moved closer from the right flank, I ordered my auxiliaries to move outside of the camp. By doing this, we would be able to attack them from the side.
after we surrounded the second army while doing rear charges to the first, they formally surrendered. I don't know what to say. This was a trial of strength. The Pergamon pikemen proved they are true descendants of Alexander's army. But still, after their defeat, these unworthy people used foul tricks to fight us. They must have poisoned our water supply, leading to illness and exhaustion in our camp. Problem that wouldn't stop us now as we pushed on, taking out one army at a time till they were no more. I ordered many buildings of our newly gained towns to be demolished in exchange for much needed farmland. We've been running on fumes these last couple of months, but now this might change. But then, I felt it inside me. Pain. Suffering. I vomit in a nearby bush. This could only mean one thing. Why, oh why, mighty Apollo, must you curse me with a disease? Ugh, I feel terrible. By the gods, I want this to stop. But I guess I should just stay happy that I'm still able to breathe. In my attempt to make this stop, I made a sacrifice to Apollo. He might be able to control disease, but he is also the one to cure it. We gathered 10 wolves, hoping it would be enough. An offering larger than what we've ever made before while campaigning. An entire month went by, till I finally felt the warmth of a holy hand above me. It must be a gift from the god of medicine himself. With its quick visit I had recovered. The sacrifice worked meaning I finally could return to the battlefield once again. I rejoined my army at Ankara, where I was enlisted. The first thing I did in my return was ordering the newly acquired homesteads in southern Galatia to produce crops for our kingdom. Next was to make the final preparations for our campaign into Pethinos. One of my generals were already besieging the town, keeping them occupied. But my forces were needed to storm the settlement. This was the last town of the Lydians, because Ptolemy II and his forces had already taken Ephesus. We couldn't allow them to take this one as well. After another month passed, we were finally in position to make our move. I'll spare you the details of this one, as it was pretty simple. They sallied out and our men performed flawlessly. With all of our combined holdings, we were at last recognized as Daidoshi. The smallest one, but still, I couldn't complain. Till we regain the title from Mithridates, we'll have to make do with what we got. By now, I finally got the time to work on our income. The Rhodians have attacked Pergamon plenty of times by now, but we've repelled them every time with the assistance of a bunch of mercenaries. Yet we couldn't continue with this kind of reckless expenditure. So we've disbanded them and their heavy upkeep in exchange for a navy to finally take the battle to the warring islanders. And also to plan ahead of time I wanted to initiate the construction of a temple of Hephaestus in Pessineos. I had three key arguments for this. One, to honor the mighty god. Two, to gain his blessing for construction, which we were about to do a lot of in the near future. And three, because we would encourage people to buy our industrialized resources, meaning more profit for our future expansion. But not much time went by till I got restless again. It was just a matter of time before the Rhodians would strike back at us. But if we got to them first, we could potentially save hundreds of people. Erasmus, the Rhodian warmonger, must have heard of my position as he tried to bypass our location by using ships. This was bad of course, but now we had free passage to the island. 
which we gladly would take. On our travels we actually found Erasmus hiding in the mountains. But he was too scared to face us, so we left him there while we sailed for Rhodas, their home. It was quite a rough journey with us losing a lot of men while crossing the ocean. But we finally got there, meaning we could make a devastating blow at the heart of our enemy. As we have seen, the majority of the enemy forces were out campaigning, leaving the settlement essentially undefended. The small garrison that remained made the honorable choice to face us on the field outside of the town. This way most citizens would be spared. Now we just needed to defeat them. in the temple was to no success as they got surrounded and with nowhere to run the last troops gave up joining our side. I honestly thought this would be the last of them, yet the army that bypassed us previously besieged Pokemon, our capital. This was their third attempt to take the city, but failed once again. Sadly, fourth time is the charm, meaning the proud capital of Pokemon fell in the hands of Rhodas. With all haste, I force marched my army into position so we could take it back. Hunt down Erasmus who was still roaming inside our territory and finally get a bit of peace in our lands. Once he was gone, we were finally free to do whatever we wanted. Kind of. We might have kicked out the Seleucids and their useless vassals, who honestly weren't that hard to beat. But I fear we made a deal with the god of trickery, Dolos. He fooled us to believe we could trust the Ptolemies. But now they act as if they were our overlords, being a constant thorn in our side and not just the Seleucids anymore. Damn those people who think they deserve to rule over my grandfather's empire. Pathetic. We should have seen this coming as they constantly tried to bribe us. Us accepting this might have made us look weak, encouraging them to do it. But there is still a solution to this. As Alexander proved when he conquered that area, 
they would just surrender to his will without much of a fight, as he was seen as a liberator. Someday we could do the same. Free the Egyptians from the Ptolemaic pretenders and reach a godlike status. Oh, what am I saying? Sorry, Zeus. I didn't mean to aspire to become one of you. I will not make the same mistake that eventually poisoned my grandfather's soul. Greed is a terrible way to die, or live with for that matter. If we were to follow up with Sumari's plan, we have to move into Thrace now, but also kick out the Egyptians from Anatolia. The latter being the more difficult part to pull off. Yet, my advisors and I came up with a decent strategy. We would embezzle as much money as we could to gain insane amounts of wealth. Then we would spend it on diplomats to four notable nations. The only two you need to remember are the Ptolemies and Colchis. And with them sent out, I marched north, ready to cross over into Thrace. While my navy kept growing larger by the second, the citizens of Pokemon have demanded us to be merciful and client state the North Thracian tribes. So that is what we will do. A month later, most of our diplomats returned with generous gifts, which helped increase our relations. But one of them wasn't so fortunate, only returning with her head in a bag. This violation we won't forget easily, but with our focus in Thrace, we'll have to let them go for now. We kept sending out diplomats, hoping to gain favorable deals. But we will have to leave that be for now, as I was finally ready to cross over into Thrace. My first target was Anthea, held by the Tillis tribe. They seemed to be caught by surprise, as they didn't really have anything resembling a garrison. But I suspect that is because most of their abled fighters were sailing at the sea. Of course, this meant our navy, which we recently have built, could take them up. I've been told most of the barbarian ships burned while our men boarded them to make sure none of them survived. This is, of course, not what the citizens of Pokemon wanted, but we wouldn't allow the Thracians to roam around at sea on a post. In Anthea, one of my men found a letter from the Odrician king, the second significant Thracian tribe, just to the north of us. They had been coordinating their attacks at the Macedonian pretenders in Pella, led by Antigonus Gonatas. The most important parts of the letter stated, If you could take Pulpediva, my men and I should be able to sneak around the Macedonian defenses. From there, I need you to muster your men and attack Pella from the east. I'll probably arrive in a few months. Together, we shall finally claim our revenge. This could potentially turn in our favor if we played this right. If we take out the Thracians for Antigonus Gonatas, we might be seen as liberators, persuading them to join my cause. This opportunity we couldn't allow to pass by. Just before I would march out, one of my diplomats came with joyous news. Ptolemies had passed side over to our sphere of influence. Maybe they aren't as bad as we once thought. I ordered the diplomat to keep working with the Egyptians to see what else we could acquire. But one good thing is always followed by a disaster. My men and I marched south towards the only bridge leading further inland. But apparently the Tillis tribe had expected this. I had walked straight into an ambush. We quickly spotted the Thracians, so we decided to make a small square with our most exposed units, while the ones out of range reformed into a proper formation. Once regrouped, they would flank around and help the ones in combat.
bunch of charges and heavy fire, the enemy surrendered. A miracle indeed. The Thracians forces were soundly defeated. We took every captured men and sold them into slavery. That is mercy in its own way. But we couldn't allow anyone to escape, so we hunted down the rest. From there, my scouts would make sure the remaining part of our path ahead was safe, so we could capture Pulpadiva with ease. The casualties were still high, but the city was ours. Or not yet, as we pursued any stragglers. It came to our attention a massive Tilai army was stationed in a forest nearby. In my search for a solution, I bought the loyalty of a bunch of Thracian mercenaries. They didn't seem to care about who was in control of that land, but rather who paid them. I mean, I didn't mind, but they were definitely not somebody I would rely upon unless it was in this kind of crisis. But now, all we could do was wait. I ordered a messenger to be sent to Eurytos to muster a second army. I feared we were about to take many casualties, and there is only one way to find out, as they attacked without warning. Inspired by the ancient Trojans, I ordered my mercenaries to halt the enemy's progress while our archers would set fire to their siege equipment and create chaos. Eventually, our men outside of the walls got overwhelmed, forcing our archers to retreat to our second choke point. pushed as hard as they could, but they never succeeded in time before the day came to a pass. We survived this time. With another victory under my belt, I was in no lack of prestige. With a foothold in Thrace, we were in a good position to complete our goals. 
Antigonus Gornata seemed to be very happy with our actions, while the northern Thracian tribes, the Odrician kingdom, despised us for it. If we took away one of their allies, they would take out one of ours. Hela was lost, with Gornatas fleeing out into the Aegean. Now, he was never actually our ally. I pretty much despised him for being a pretender. But the message was clear. We would be next. Even worse is that Hades had ordered his monsters to occupy the Oracle of Delphi now. We must find a way to save them to complete the first quest given to us by Zeus. With one of the two major Thracian tribes gone, we could finally get a bit of breathing room. Except the Odrician kingdom, who seemed to be quite mad at us, have something else planned. Two of their armies are currently moving towards Pulpadiva. Thanks Zeus, our reinforcements have arrived. If not, we might have been in deep trouble. A rebellion was growing in Anthea, so I ordered Eurytos, the one who led the reinforcements to us, to march over there and deal with them. With whatever forces he still had under his command, he extinguished their scarce, annoying sparks. My fleet would prepare to block Pella and potentially invade it if an opportunity arrives. I also had to be wary of demonic beings to our west, as they have crushed the city-state of Athens and stolen Athena Parthenon. Maybe we could retrieve it at some point and restore Hellenic honor to the world. But for now, we have to focus on the ones threatening our very existence. I marched my royal guard up next to the barbarian army, encamping as close as possible hoping it would provoke them enough to engage us. And with that, the war had begun. I honestly imagined they would make a counter move during that next month, but no. Instead, the rebellion made a foolish attempt resulting in them fleeing to Odessa. And then, it came to my mind why the Odrysians were so quiet. They had been regrouping for a massive strike against my encampment. I didn't have time to escape without making my situation worse. We had to hold our ground. Odorus, the Odrician warchief, stepped forward, shouting, We meet at last, Eumenes, grandson of Alexander. You can relax, my famous friend. I won't dare to kill you yet. Once I capture you, I'll just make you suffer for a week first. Just like we did with Antigonus Gonatus. <laughs> If he dared to speak to us like that, our spears should do the talking for us. The Thracian king didn't seem to have a proper plan of attack as he rushed straight into our pikemen. I saw this as an opportunity to hunt down his cavalry so I could bring out a second force to hit them from the flank. Once the remaining Thracian soldiers were engaged, my archers returned to hit them from behind, forcing them to surrender. The arrogant warchief escaped, 
but the same could not be said for most of his men. Back in our own province, I demanded our nation to be much more centralized. All of our income should come from Asia alone, while the neighboring province of Galatia and Cappadocia will bring most of the food. Hopefully, our situation could become even better. If only the Ptolemies gave us Ephesus. We should have captured it while we still had the chance. Still, I feel bad for being mean to them. They keep giving us generous gifts to invest in our kingdom. Surprisingly, to be honest, as we still don't have our rightful title of heir. No matter. As we spend it on slave traders, fully knowing the Ptolemies will be sold there at some point in the future. Ironic. But for now, it's only the Thracians. Speaking of Thracians, let us return to the warfront. Finally, we had arrived at Nysos. Once my army entered the settlement, resistance halted. Before I could give any command to my men, they rushed forward to sack the town. But we eventually returned, liberating them, and delighted by our deeds, the newly formed Dardanoi were willing to become a client state for a bit of gold and access to our trade routes. A reasonable offer, in my opinion. This way, I could satisfy the citizens of Pokemon while still growing our influence in Thrace. Our word trade is now ended, and I will accept your proposal. Come to the ale. The same happened at Odessos, where Euritos liberated the town and client stated them. This left Pella as the last settlement under Odrishian control. But thanks to our skilled fighters, we finally captured the former settlement of the Macedonian pretenders and the home of my ancestors. While scouting the battlefield, one of my men found a message buried under a Greek messenger. It appears he never could deliver it. Written by Antigonus Gonatas, it stated, to Antiochus, ruler of the Seleucids. I was wrong. Eumenes must be the rightful ruler. After all, why would he attempt to save Mastodon in its most dire need? My position is contested and I fear my life is coming to an end. If I fall, I plead that you may support Eumenes no matter what. Antigonus Gonatas of Macedon. Although I achieved more joy by reading this letter than anything else in the world, I was filled with dread. We are literally within touching distance of Hades monsters. I began to doubt myself. Could the rumors be true of them being sent to destroy anything touched by Alexander? I couldn't take the risk. Pella needed to become a fortress strong enough to keep anyone at bay. But a simplistic garrison wouldn't be enough. We required a proper army stationed there at all times, guarding our territory while Eurytus and I returned back to Pokemon. The militia would be based on our newly reformed Thorio units, our highest skilled soldiers at a settlement at highest priority. What could go wrong? Once I returned home, it was finally time to make a new plan. As great as the reward may be, I'm extremely against engaging godly beings like the ones to the west. They might hold two tactics at Athens and Taras, as well as the Oracle of Delphi and the entrance to the underworld, but their armies are vast with an endless supply of manpower from fallen soldiers. There are even rumors among my men stating Achilles himself is leading one of their armies but if not them, we could seek an audience with the Seleucids. By delivering the letter we just found, an alliance could be made. Yet, I don't know how to feel about this. They did torment the Pokemonian kingdom for generations. I'm not sure if I can forgive them for that. Also, we are allied with the Ptolemies. And the Seleucids and Ptolemies, they are age-old enemies. That could create problems for us. But yet again, it could keep the status quo. Our current situation was more complicated than ever. 
The citizens of Pokemon screamed of warfare in the east. Armenia was weak and therefore an obvious target for us. The same could be said for Egypt, who wouldn't expect an attack now. There is still time to keep the balance of the Hellenic world and save the Seleucids. But an esteemed advisor's opinion weighs more. Sumari pleaded us to face the wrath of the gods, whatever the price, save Greece from the evil beings known as Romans and gain massive advantages. The reward is simply too great. Face them we must, yet our forces were severely weakened after our war in Thrace. More armies and soldiers were required. For that we need gold. I kept embezzling money while we never ceased to stop sending diplomats to the Ptolemies. For a while, they actually didn't seem too interested in us. Have they heard the news from Antigonus Gonatas? Maybe they're starting to think of us as a rival? I can't tell from here. No matter, as we didn't need their support, our attempt to centralize our kingdom has paid off. Asia Minor now flowed with gold and precious resources ready for us to use. With that, we were able to prepare three new armies while keeping our fleets up and running. Before I set out to Greece, I debated whether to increase our taxes or not, but decided against it. With that said, I marched out alongside my men. With the assistance of grateful locals who wished us success, we could safely sneak past Larissa, so the Romans had no chance to defend Athens from our attack. The once mighty city-state switched to our side at the exact second all of the Roman invaders were killed. And after looking around, it was clear to see why. The rumors were true. Hades had stolen Athena Parthenon. This was why they interfered in Greece. The statue must have been brought to the underworld for the amusement of Hades. There is only one way to know for sure. We must save the Oracle of Delphi for answers. Our first tactic was also found here. A scroll that mentioned the arts of forming a triangle or wedge to cut through the enemy's center and score great victories. This will definitely prove to be useful. And just like that, messages from all over the kingdom arrived. Seeing our heroic deeds in fighting Rome, the Egyptians showed their generosity to us again. They gave us Ephesus alongside unprecedented wagons of gold and silver. Our war was definitely funded now. I immediately ordered the recruitment of more ships and armies. Now we weren't fighting against the odds, we were the odds. As I laid siege to Larissa, one of my generals found a demonic army moving towards us, destroying everything in its path. They couldn't fight on their own, so I recalled them back to me. Which scared the Romans, I think. At least they retreated back, most likely seeking to return to the underworld. Without hesitation, we pursued. Here, it actually would have been a good idea to visit the Oracle of Delphi now. But we simply didn't have time for it. It had to wait. And there we are. Our first major battle against godlike beings. We might outnumber them 2 to 1, but don't be fooled. Their strength is beyond ours. The fight will take place here. Let me see if I got this right. I'm supposed to add my shock infantry to the tip of my formation while the pikemen and hoplites are guarding their flanks. Archers in the center and me alongside our cavalry anywhere on the field. Good. But the scroll said nothing about reinforcements. Oh well, I'll just add them to the flank. Some of them might stay behind as backup.
The Romans were moving around in weird formations, making it hard to actually get a proper charge. But the battle eventually started, so I ordered all of our cavalry to support our right flank. The left would slowly engage the enemy as well. numbers were too great for these demonic beings. I never thought I could defeat armies summoned by the gods. A victory was great, but not enough. Apollonia was still under Roman control, and before they were freed, my quest wasn't completed. At the same time, another of my armies marched further up the coast to do the same as we did in Thrace. He liberated the towns and client-stated them. It took quite a lot of gold this time, but we have plenty of it. I couldn't complain. And yet again, as one of the tribes actually refused to submit to our reign, he will have to be taken care of in the future. I had also sent over spies to what I believed was the underworld. So far the enemies were out of sight. Until they decided to reveal themselves, they will be easy targets. With that, I captured Polonia, officially liberating Greece and gaining a massive perk in the process. If I were to die, I could rewind time once to give me a second chance of success. I doubt I'm ever gonna need it, but it is better than utter failure. Further down the coast, a massive clash between our fleets took place. I don't know the full extent of the battle as I wasn't there, but all I know is that our brave marines succeeded. By now, a familiar flash appeared before me. Zeus had returned. Humanes, you have achieved much since we last spoke. You have risen above expectation and established yourself as a true Diadochi, ruling from Cappadocia to Greece. You have even secured several important locations which will help you an extra life and the honoring oracle of Delphi. Your fight against the Romans is over. You men will do the rest, but another task awaits you in the east. It is time for you to follow the path of your ancestor, Alexander the Great. But first, Seek the answers you require from the oracle, you will need it. With the news of me not being needed in Italy, I gave command of my army over to Atalus, an important character you might get to know in the future. But now I had other things to attend to. 
Before I entered the halls of the Oracle, I had to figure out what to ask for. I can only ask one question for now. It can be about my most dangerous enemy, where to find a specific tactic, or even how to gain mass wealth. Maybe where the Athena Parthenon is being kept. I have to think carefully about this one. Really, there was only one true question I wanted to learn the truth of. Before walking in, I adjusted my attire. There was nothing more shameful than to appear lazy in front of the gods, especially the oracle, as she can determine my future. I had to make a good impression. As confident as ever, I walked into the halls of the oracle. Not long after, I felt the chills down my spine. She was right there, looking straight at me with a cold but firm look. It stunned me for a second, but after a small pep talk to myself, I locked eyes with her, ready to speak. Oh great oracle, it is I, Eumenes, the true heir of- Alexander, yes, I have foreseen your visit. Ask your question, for you have only one. I wish to reunite the great Macedonian Empire like my great-grandfather before me. My grandfather, however, never lost a battle, and I have been humbled at Pontus. I ask you, will I stand as the true heir of Alexander? The true heir of Alexander? Toi kratis toi, to the strongest. So said Alexander, son of Zeus. Are you the strongest, Eumenes? If so, then you shall find no difficulty is enough to challenge you. If not, then you are no heir of Alexander. You have asked your question, and I have answered. Feeling like my confusion only got worse, I wanted to follow up on her reply. But two armed guards interrupted, demanding me to leave or else be thrown out. After being forced out, I turned around telling one of the brutes, What is the meaning of this? Can't you just give me a clear answer? He calmly replied, Ha! Do I look like Alexander to you? Why don't you go ask his corpse? Maybe you will find more luck there. He kept laughing till he was out of sight. But this actually gave me an idea. Mithridates still holds my title of heir. But I've heard he fled down to Alexandria seeking refuge under the Ptolemies. Maybe I got my answer after all. Alexander's corpse was just a clue to reassure me of where I needed to go. I will travel to Alexandria, retrieving my grandfather and put an end to Mithridates. By now, Atalus had returned from his campaign in Magna Graecia, scoring one victory after another. As he subjugated Rome, he recruited some of his former foes who got down the most Greeks. Publicly, he stated they could prove to be useful for city assaults, but in private, he told me they were a souvenir and a way to humiliate the Romans for eternity. I only cared about their abilities with a sword, hence we brought them with us. He also brought back another scroll. This one mentioned the Triplus ACs. It seemed too complicated for me, so I probably wouldn't use it. Still, my toolkit expands, making us more flexible than ever to deal with any opponent. If we want to reach Alexandria, we will have to go by land, through the Levant. The seas are contested by the Egyptian navies and just overall dangerous, whereas the land route is only being blocked by the Seleucids. After a while with plenty of traveling and recruiting, I arrived outside of Tarsus, a Seleucid settlement that luckily wouldn't stand in our way for long. After a quick fight, we had a foot in the Levant. Here we were finally able to see the two Diadoshi fight from the front lines. Furthermore, knowing we required allies further inland, I made an agreement with Saba of Arabia. Hopefully they will prove to be worthy allies. And with that done, I laid siege to Antiochia, a settlement the Seleucids had liberated a month prior. 
they would enjoy independence for a while longer, as we still required proper siege equipment. But that doesn't mean nothing happened. So far, we have only meddled with Seleucid affairs. Now, it was time to interfere with the arrogant Ptolemies as well. One of my fleets attempted to assault Salamis from the sea, but failed miserably. Losing well over half of his crew and ships, he returned back to side, looking to replenish. This defeat left our ports in danger of naval raids. Hence I called for Herodes, a skilled admiral who served a vital role in the defeat of Rome. Outside the coast of Sparta, the first major clash of the Titans took place. Led by the mighty Ptolemaic admiral Patrocles, Herodes prepared his men for battle. It took seven days of combat before the battle was over. The Pergamene fleet prevailed obliterating the main strength of Egypt. He would then sail down to Africa in an attempt to bring the conflict to them. But he got quickly repelled, forcing him to take the long route through Sicily back to Greece. While he was over there, a hostile fleet attempted to take side back. But fortune favored us as we already had a bunch of ships ready to defend the town. Once back, Herodes realized our fleets were in need of improvements. Mass port upgrades got initiated all over the kingdom. But just too late as the last still standing enemy fleet attacked again. At the exact same spot, he defeated one enemy fleet in the past, now he had to do it again. This time with a lot more casualties. This is also the reason he enslaved all of the captives. After all, if they can work on a ship, I'm sure they can work in the mines. With the waters finally cleared of Egyptian scum, one of my fleets sailed over to Antiochia, ready to assist us in our grand assault. We have even brought a new tool, unlike anything the world has ever seen. I would have loved to tell you the tale of this great victory, yet the gods meddled with my memory, making it impossible. After the battle, I quickly seized a few fleeing soldiers before moving into Thapsiklos. From here, we spotted an Egyptian army besieging Palmyra. This was our greatest opportunity to find more intel about Mithridates' whereabouts. Standing before the enemy, I saw the banners of the pharaoh. But not the ones of Ptolemy, rather Ipernatus. As much joy this brought me, the same amount of dread and fear followed. No matter how strong of a Diadoshi you are, death claims us all. I will have to forget that, as we are about to fight. Feeling the importance of this battle, I got inspired by my grandfather. All of our cavalry were on the right, led by me. A declining front line of pikemen and phalaxmen were in the center, with elephants in behind ready to run down the enemy. I led all of the cavalry forward, hoping to intimidate the enemy. It worked so well they decided to rearrange their formation. From here, the battle would begin.
Does this victory mean I'm the strongest Daidoshi? I sure hope so. The Oracle will have proven to be on our side, if that is the case. Nevertheless, I captured Palmyra for myself, as I just saved them from Egypt. They happily applied. They didn't really care for who ruled the great city. I just happened to offer them no taxes. Atalus the Great found no trouble in pushing further into Mesopotamia, taking Edessa without much trouble at all. This made us border Saba, who had been on a massive northern expansion into the Seleucid territory. We could now trade with them, as well as getting a lot more intel on other desert factions, such as the Nabataeans. Thanks Zeus, they are on our side. The last I wanted was to expand into Arabia. The heat alone will take out most of my men. The last I heard from Metallus was that he pushed further down towards Seleucia. If he can take that, that would be the end of the Seleucid Empire. Meanwhile he did that, the fleet took revenge on Salamis, with some major casualties and followed up by another naval battle between the Egyptians and Pokemon. But after that they were able to help me conquer Tyrus, and this gave us access to recruit two new armies that will be used in our subjugation of the East and Egypt. Oh Mithridates, I sure hope you can feel it. I am coming for you. Several months later have gone by since the siege of Tyrus. Time well spent on recruiting and replenishing our forces for our invasion of Egypt. Now I stand before Jerusalem, ready to seize its treasures and high walls. Reinforcing my endeavor is my newly formed siege regiment, bringing both ballistas and elite Syrian war elephants. The walls won't stand a chance. Most of our forces, including our reinforcements, will attack from the south, but I've sent a small detachment of Thracian folksmen and Phrygian slingers over to the western approach in an attempt to sneak inside the settlement without being recognized. With the equipment now in place, it is time to begin. Our siege crafts will fire relentless volleys at the walls creating two access points, one at each side of the main gate. Once made, our Syrian war elephants will charge through, making it easy for my hoplites to enter. A few of my pikemen will burn down the gate to enter the courtyard. It will be dangerous, true, but worth it. The enemy archers will hopefully focus on them rather than the other units. of our elephants went over to assist our Thracian forces, who got spotted early on. The rest would run through the streets and appear behind enemy lines for devastating rear charges.
last standing Egyptians tried to protect the royal palace, but being too focused on the pikemen ahead of them, they never saw the countless two-ton beasts smashing into them from behind. With the last hostile fortification taken, we are now in full control of the Levant. Well, if Atala succeeded in taking Seleucia, no one could contest us. I wonder what that man is up to. No matter, with Jerusalem under my command, I could launch countless raids into Egypt. With my fleets blockading Alexandria, they are basically broken already. As far as I've heard, they made several attempts to break through. But of course my reliable admiral Herodes wouldn't let their foolish acts slip through the cracks of our defenses. Yet their pain and suffering could be over if they just did one thing. I am a merciful man and know after the death of Ptolemy they aren't going to be a threat in the future. Mithridates however, he is hiding somewhere in there, if not, no, no. I can't give any attention to that thought. His very existence disgraces me for eternity. I will have to end his life. I can only imagine he's staying at least near Alexandria. Still, this wasn't a fact and I wouldn't leave anything to chance. I left the siege regiment behind, they only slowed me down. Before they can arrive in Alexandria, I will be able to make a small detour through Memphis which was the only other logical location for him to hide, if he still were in Egypt. We actually made a rather peaceful occupation. My simple words of I'm not here to hurt any of you, there's just this one man with a tongue like a snake, have any of you seen him? Seemed to be enough. Apparently that was enough for the citizens to hail me as the pharaoh. I'm flattered, especially as they immediately began recruiting workers for a new pyramid in my honor. But those magnificent structures are only meant for one thing. They are a massive tomb for the pharaohs of old. Whatever sick game the gods are playing right now, I don't want to know any more about it. About a month later, the ballistas finally arrived at Alexandria. It was incredible to see the waves of fireballs crash into the once majestic jewel of Africa. Who knows, maybe one of them hit Mithridates by accident. I hope not, he deserves worse. After the fall of their precious capital and Memphis, which they lost a month earlier, the nobles of Egypt surrendered, becoming a client state of Pergamon. But as it always seems be, I didn't have time to search for Mithridates. Not even celebrate my victory. At last, I received the news of Atalus and his expedition in the east. Commander. The report begins about the same time as the siege of Jerusalem took place. Outside of Seleucia, he waited, hoping an opportunity would arrive. Specifically, it mentioned Saba and Parthia. The latter I'm not too familiar with myself. If they are at war with the Seleucids, I hope it is a national conflict and not against all Greeks. But back to the report, as his expectations came true. In a way, the last Seleucid forces pushed into the east, towards Parthian lands, leaving their only bastion vulnerable for the Arabians to sack it. This of course also allowed Atalus to peacefully march in and garrison the walls with his own Italic troops. Apparently, as the Seleucid warriors returned home, they got met with arrows at the gates, marking the end of their dynasty. I can't believe what I'm reading. The ones who tormented the reign of my uncle. The ones who worked with Antigonus Gonatas to find the true heir of Alexander but never knew it was me. The ones I fought and killed as they stood in my way are finally gone. I am the final Diadoshi still standing. Unless... My thoughts got interrupted by my polymark who encouraged me to read on. And rightfully so. The last sentence mentioned that Talos' intent to move north into Armenia. No mention of why or how. He didn't need to either, as I wanted to do it myself, but not now. I intended to attack them by surprise 
and swoop their territory off of their feet. I need to move north, now. Of course, I couldn't leave the thought of abandoning my search for Mithridates like this. I ordered a small force to stay behind and turn every stone and cone of sand for his reeking body. As the village of Samosata came into view, my men prepared for combat. Atalus had already taken Gansak and Fraspa. It was about time I did something as well. Luckily, I had found another tactic at Alexandria I just barely had time to bring with me. Let's see if it actually works. The horns of the buffalo works like this. You have two horns, one at each flank. In the center you have the chest and behind them is a reverse force called the loins. Let's see how effective this is. The enemy had gone much more extended than expected, so I quickly formed a half circle with the chest and loins. My horns used their mobility to get around the approaching forces and hit them from the side. With our ruthless strikes from our horns, the Armenian forces capitulated. A decisive victory. The tactic certainly seemed to prove useful. The Armenians instantly knew their forces were no match for mine and accordingly gave in just like the Egyptians. Not with all the formalities of a massive pyramid symbolizing my demise. Rather, the best and yet worst news I could get. They had intercepted a message from Atalus in the past meant for me. It was a fairly short letter this time, but more important than ever. It stated, Mithridates leads the armies of Parthia. He united with Bactria and took out the Mauryans, and now rule all of the east. I will march for Gansak at once to stop their advance. But watch out, we are outnumbered in this war and they know of this advantage. They are coming for you. How Mithridates evaded my armies in Egypt and ended up in Parthia is beyond my knowledge. I can only imagine it is my lazy patrols I have to blame. Still, this is useless speculation now. He is coming with all of his Parthian allies. The massive eastern nation controls the Cyprus mountains between our borders, making it extremely hard to invade. If we are to win this war, we need to lure them out into the open field. On the other hand, their heaps of armored cavalry will crush our forces if that is the case. Therefore, I sent a small group of spies into their territory to gather some intel. If we knew where their armies are, a proper defensive frontier could be established to keep them at bay. To our luck, their forces were all far away to actually engage us, meaning even the siege regiment from Alexandria could arrive in time. Furthermore, we began recruiting another team in Seleucia, adding our total strength up to four armies. But compared to the countless Persian battalions on the way, this wasn't enough. Stationed at Athens, I had a reserve army that formerly was part of a two-army group keeping an eye on Rome. But they have been quiet ever since losing their capital, hence I recalled them to the east. Even though this was greatly needed, it would take time before they could arrive. Till then, we were on our own. To make matters worse, a plague started to spread in Pergamon. In Pergamon! Our pride citizens are falling like flies, to what shouldn't even have been a threat for us in the first place. There's only one fitting name for this plague. Abalos 19. Returning to the front lines, important news arrived about three Persian armies collectively traveling through Susa and towards Mesopotamia. On their own we should be able to handle them, but Pasa, 
the Persian state defending the Saklos Mountains added two more armies to their numbers by sending their own south. This left Ekbatana, the biggest fortification defending the pass, into Persia defenseless. Knowing Attalus were on his way from Gansak to assist in this siege, I started building proper equipment to scale the walls. This is where it gets a bit complicated. Two Parsa forces were pushing towards Seleucia, with another Parthian army not far behind. Then they also had two more forces in the mountains, one pushing the same way as the others, and one moving north to save Ekbatana. Up there, yet another army had arrived. They could potentially strike me before Atalus could save me. Something I wasn't willing to risk. I decided to fall back and stay hidden for a while, hoping they lived. Even further inland, yet another force was on its way, going for Gansak. And still, with all of these armies, we know one of them was missing from the south, staying in the shadows outside of our range. And just in case we've forgotten, we only had two armies at Seleucia and two outside of Ekbatana. Well, we had our allies in the area too, but the Nabataeans are traitors, not used to warfare. They will just let us do the work for them and reap the reward afterwards. What was my solution to this, you might ask? Use one army to protect the walls alongside the Nabataeans and send one into the mountains to lay ambushes and continue the siege of Ekbatana. By now, the plague of Balos 19 had spread to Ephesus and even north into Cimmerian lands. I had men researching a way to solve the problem, but they said it would take at least half a year before a sustainable solution could be found. A catastrophe indeed. And now the army in the north was in striking distance of our towns. I had to do something. Once again we broke the siege of Vekbatana, so I could go north and intercept the army. Atalus would protect the main path into Mesopotamia, allowing the other two in the south to go even further down to confront the Persian forces. Of course they weren't able to attack, but just had to wait for the right opportunity. To my surprise, my interception actually worked in the north, meaning it was time to strike. Hopefully, I can survive the onslaught of Persian cataphract cavalry. As the battle was about to take place on an open field, I kept my men in a tight formation. But as I was the one to instigate the battle, I had to make the first move, and therefore couldn't just sit here. Or well, not exactly, as I would use my lightly armored Javkev I've had with me since the start of my journey to lure the enemy in. As we only captured one of the enemy units first time, I had to throw out the bait once again. This time with a bit more success. The 
cataphracts would rush forward in full force, hoping my pikemen would flee by their roaring speed alone. Ha! If only they knew what was about to happen. During the last part of the battle, the Parthian general ran into my lines himself, like the foolish soldiers before him. This was my chance to run out and hunt him down. A victory this decisive surely must bring horror and fear to Mithridates. I am no longer the weak, inexperienced general of the Pergamene Royal Guard. I am Eumenes, the king of Pergamon and rightful ruler of the Macedonian Empire. And anyone who stands in my way shall be crushed. With all the reports I received from the south, I ordered them to split up into three separate groups while keeping two of them hidden. This turned out to make the Parthians relocate some of their armies, but all the armies in Seleucia finally came to bite us in the butt. The supplies had run out, meaning my forces couldn't stay there any longer. Hence they began their counterattack, first taking out the Parthian Shah Arsakis along with another army. Pergamene casualties were still very high compared to the many enemies they still had to take out, but they had to keep pushing. Luckily the Parthians favored a fight with me and the reinforcing army from Athens that finally had arrived, leaving Susa open for an assault. Now almost all of the Persian armies were stuck in the pass between Susa and Ekbatana, making it possible for us to cut off any escape route. All I had to do was take Ekbatana, which I did with ease. Now the next that happened was a pure slaughterhouse. After what just happened, the Parthians were reduced to just two armies. One of them stole Susa right in front of us, that man being Mithridates. I ordered all of our forces to follow me south to deal with my rival. I stabbed the general of his army and forced the town to surrender. Standing before Mithridates, he pleaded for mercy, saying stuff about how he spared my life way back when he defeated me. I thought it was just a cheap shot to mock me one last time, but my polymark pleaded me to wait. I need to think about what to do with Mithridates. We have come a long way from where it all began. I have captured the Sacros Mountains, giving us a perfect place to launch an invasion into the Persian heartland. Even better is the fact that I've captured the only man to ever outsmart me, Mithridates of Pontus. But the best of all is my long lost title, which I finally possess again. I am at last the true heir of Alexander. It feels good. It tastes like victory to me. 
yet I still need to deal with my nemesis. Advisor Samari came up with an intriguing approach. We shall put poison in his food, make his death unexpected and ensure the world won't figure out I did it. But as we continued with our plan, nothing happened. He must be blessed by Apollo, just like I am with Zeus. Is that the reasoning behind the godly visits from the Lord of Olympus himself? I cannot risk going against the will of the gods and fear a curse. Let me be merciful, just like Alexander was with King Darius' family. He shall live as a servant on a farm far away from public life, shoving goat shit for the rest of his life. As my quarrels were with Mithridates alone, I sued for peace with the Parthians. For strategic purposes, of course. Supplies were limited and our numbers of men even more so. Continuing the assault was practically impossible. Hence I ordered my men to spread out all over our kingdom to replenish, leaving just one unscathed army in the east. In the meantime I would focus on internal affairs, making sure our economy could sustain the size of our mighty armies and the vast amount of territory we command. A few more things happened in the west. Nothing too major, just the Gataeans invading and Massalia taking control over most of northern Italy. Well, it didn't just happen in our short time of peace, but over a much larger period of time. But that is not as important for what is about to happen. The Bactrians started to push hard on Saba, our ally. Gore had fallen into their hands with Charax soon to follow unless we did something to distract the Easterners fast. To make matters worse, the Parthians have become rather bold, with one of their armies moving through our lands and almost into Mesopotamia. Enough was enough. I marched the Pergamene Royal Guard down to intercept the Parthian battalion. As the Parthians had learned from their past mistakes, they brought way more infantry than just cavalry. So I chose to swap the wedge tactic for an oblique order and horns of the buffalo hybrid. It is rather simple to be fair, but sometimes simple is the best approach. I used my Thracian cavalry to lure the enemy close, like I've done in the past. Once in range, my skirmishers could deal with their cavalry. My pikes would then slowly approach to pin down the enemy. Once that was done, my mounted units had an easy time attacking the enemy from behind. With that decisive victory, the final war had broken up. I didn't even bother hunting down the last few units. I knew they would surrender once I put enough pressure on their cities, which my armies are in great position to do. The first town to fall was Raga, an iron outpost which has seen a lot of war during the last few months. We are just the latest of many regimes to rule their lands. They won't care for us like the ones before that. But then Bactria joined the war as well to add up for this easy occupation. I will talk a lot more about them in the future. Same with the Count Lee, who refused to support us and declared their independence. For now, we need to focus on the Persians, as one of the lesser kings made a counterattack on Raga with surprisingly little effect. With their forces weakened, I had a chance to raid their walled city with ease. This should have been the end of them, yet I was so impressed by their courage to fight me, I left them as a client state. Something which was about to bite me in the ass. 
but I wanted to reach the edge of the world, so we seized Sadrakata for us to use it as a slingshot into their most valuable settlements. Here we split up our forces to cover more ground, one army pushing to Nisa, with another towards Susa. I would stay behind ready to reinforce where we would experience the most resistance. But with that move alone, the most influential Parthian king yielded to our rule, adding all of his holdings to the Pergamene kingdom. All that remained was Bactria and three minor Persian kings, where we are actually about to cross blades with one of them. The tiny kingdom of Haraliva tried to block our path towards their silver mines. But by the sight of my host of 10,000 strong fighters, they scattered in the wind, luring us further into their lands where they revealed the most consequential threat of them all. Their scorched earth tactic, making it impossible to supply our armies. But before we keep going on that, let me explain what happened in the west while I was away. Most of my forces were either with me in the east or to the south, keeping the Bactrians at bay. This of course meant that Khan Li, who ruled the Armenian lands on a post, could declare war on us. Same for Komis, the courageous Persian king, whom we subjugated. And of course, he wasted no time as both Raga and Sadrakata fell in record time. To our luck, one of my armies had just left the iron mines to assist in the war against Bactria. Now they turned around to finish this treacherous king, like I should have done when I had the chance. With swift speed, he pushed into Hecatompylos, securing their high walls. He had a few more fights with them, but they never became more than just a nuisance to us. For the Kartli, it was even simpler. I had already recalled my army in Egypt, which searched for Mithridates, but as that no longer was needed, I brought them over to the front lines. They along with another force occupied Dura and Hatra in just two months. Later they would punish the Kartli by taking Tushpa and Asamosata away from them and then sue for peace with a monetary benefit. And now that we are over here, I might as well explain to you what the Bactrians did at Gaul. Their incredible numbers destroyed the Saba forces in the region and pursued them into the desert. This was their biggest possible mistake as one of my armies could just disrupt their supply lines by capturing Tharax. Let them starve in the hot sun, let them fall for the same reason I didn't want to fight the Arabians and allied with them. Standing alone with minimal support, Gaul valiantly battled my men, but to no success. It would eventually be double teamed by two of my armies and fall into our hands. That should wrap up everything in the west. Now allow me to finish my expedition in the east. We were in desperate need of supplies to keep our advance going. I expected them to have whatever they possessed in Marv, and that was false. They were guarded by their armies, which by now had spread themselves all over the countryside. I was the only one lucky enough to catch one ensuring the good health and well-being of my loyal soldiers. But as I tried to return north to deal with Hariva, I came into contact with the only Bactrian army defending their lands. They blocked my path, making it impossible to deal with our raiding enemies. So we assassinated the general. You should see that as a justified act. Not like the deed of Hades like the Bactrians did. Even though we had a river between us, they still fired the first volley of arrows. This is my opportunity to deal with them once and for all. As they were moving rather fast, I quickly rushed whatever infantry I had ready over to the shallows. Further down the river, my cavalry crossed too, and after making sure there was no possible escape route, 
they charged. The battle was fierce, with the river slowly turning red with blood. With water to their hips and heavy armor weighing them down, blocking our long pikes was practically impossible. By the sight of our cavalry, they routed. The thing is, it just made my job a whole lot easier. Bactria was now undefended. All of the armies had been destroyed. My men and I just needed to seize their settlements. Atalus took the main part of our forces and went into the nearest town with the food supply. That being Amol. He had to fight quite hard for it, but overcame their foes as always. By then we spent an entire month hunting down stragglers, hurting our food production in the province. My men suffered the most from this as we ran out of rations once again. But after a quick visit into Parthian lands, all wagons were filled and ready to finish our long expedition. Feeling the war had prolonged long enough, each town surrendered one by one, offering gifts in attempt to redeem their overlords. Knowing they had nothing to do with the deeds of their leaders, we spared their lives. If I could spare the life of Mithridates, the one to wound my pride forever, then cities of innocent peasants wasn't a problem. I personally marched around in the south claiming the allegiance of Capicene, just to meet up with the rest of my forces in Eucratidea. We had finally done it. I cannot believe how far I've come. From an 18 year old boy, not knowing where I was from, to be the king of Pergamon, ruler of the Macedonian Empire, spanning from the eastern edges to Magna Graecia. From my birthplace in Sinope to the pyramids of Memphis. I am now 30. 30! I've had to spend 12 years reclaiming the territory, it took my grandfather just 8. I will never surpass him, but I sure hope I made him proud. Same with Zeus, I completed most of his tasks, almost all of his mentioned tactics came into my possession. I wonder which ones I missed. Same with Athena Parthenon. The minions of Hades stole her from Athens long ago. Who knows how famous I will become by returning that to Athens. Athena will surely bless me with knowledge beyond measure. The spawn of Hades, also known as Romans, have regained most of their power in Northern Africa. Maybe I will send Atalus out on an expedition to find the statue. 